may be getting. You can't always. This is the death. Remarkably him. Turn back. Towards God. Rise up. Welcome to Shalom World's Heart Talk. I'm your host, Dina Marie, and we're blessed today to take you to Canada to meet Archbishop Marie Chatelain. His grace was ordained to the priesthood in 1987, and then he was ordained a bishop in 2007. In 2012, he was appointed to serve in the Archdiocese of Kiwatin La Pa, one of the northernmost dioceses in Canada, a vast territory of northern Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Welcome, Your Grace, to Heart Talk. It is a delight to have you with us today. Good to be with you here, Dina Marie. As we begin, I'd love to hear a little bit about your faith formation, the family that you grew up in, and how did you start to hear the call to the priesthood and then to respond to that call? Well, I realize now that I was blessed with a very good family, and uh, uh, both my dad and my mom were very active in practicing their faith. Dad often in leadership in the parish council, and uh, my mom in uh, singing and choir. And uh, as a young family, we would be at church and often, especially Lent weekday masses. And so it just kind of inspired me. Both of my parents uh, really reflected that these were essential things, your faith. And uh, for some reason, as a young man, a teenager, I had a passion for the rosary. And I would pray the rosary every day. And uh, that really seemed to give me help and strength uh, throughout the tumultuous teenage years. And so I really think Mother Mary has had a big part in uh, where I am today. I know your grace, your Episcopal motto you selected was, uh, the Almighty has done great things for me, as you talk about our Blessed Mother and the Magnificat. Why did you select that motto, and how do you see that reflected in your role as a bishop today? Bit of a long story. I think it started when I was a young priest in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And I decided to go on a 30-day retreat, Ignatian retreat. And so I thought it would be a fairly normal kind of retreat, but it was really a life changer for me. It wasn't too long into the retreat where I had this sense that God was calling me to marry the poor. And not just to spend a little time or be nice, but to marry the poor. And uh, that scared me, but it also had an, an impact on me. And so I uh, started to adjust my priesthood. I was more involved in the inner city of uh, Saskatoon. I was more involved with indigenous peoples uh, and uh, kind of urban issues. And pretty soon I started to get this hunger to know where the indigenous people were coming from more. And God really put on my heart a passion to learn one of the indigenous languages. I'm not sure where it came from God because it wasn't from anything else in my background. And so I eventually got permission to study what's called the Dene uh, Sothina language, one of our indigenous groups. And I went up to uh, Lalash, Saskatchewan, and then on from there to Black Lake, Fond du Lac, Saskatchewan. And it was immersion by fire. And uh, I really think that God called me to that so that when I was ordained a bishop, I had all this experience already. And I think it was God early on doing amazing things in my life to prepare me to serve him later. So that's really, I think, Mother Mary and uh, our God uh, preparing me with amazing things. That is so wonderful to hear. You know, as we know, Canada is home, and you've mentioned to such a large and diverse population of Indigenous people. What really has been your strategy, your way of approaching this population as a bishop and even early on as a priest to really reach out and to touch and connect with these groups of people? Early on, I was invited to join in one of the indigenous rituals called uh, um, a fasting, sacred fasting vision quest. 
And so I and uh, five other priests joined about 30 people on one of these vision quests, which means you start with uh, a sweat lodge and with uh, other uh, prayer ceremonies, and then you go to um, the uh, uh, fasting of four days without any food or water. And so that was a pretty significant commitment of uh, learning about uh, the indigenous spirituality. But it was a very powerful experience. I realized that uh, the vision for me was from the sacred fire and that uh, I was not to create the fire, but to allow God to make the fire happen. And so the vision I received was that uh, God is uh, uh, going to start the fire when it's the right time. And I need to get in the right places. I need to get the wood prepared and all the things for the fire, but then he'll start it. So that's been kind of a gift for me in my ministry that I'm not here to fix the people. I'm not here to start these fires all over the place, but that I try to be in the right place, do my little part, and then to let God make the Holy Spirit fires happen in the ways that they need to. And so I find that those kind of events happen when I sort of relax and let God uh, be the main actor. Your grace, as you've been serving the needs of the people in your archdiocese, what do you see are really the greatest needs in the family and the culture that you really try to address with our Catholic faith? Well, I think our sacraments are beautiful and uh, our people uh, to find ways to embrace those sacraments for kind of encouragement and strengthening. Uh, I really look for the people who are hungering and trying for spiritual growth for forgiveness, for forgiveness of themselves, and for uh, really trying to move forward. And those people I try to do all I can to accompany. And uh, I have, I think, several good friends who are fellow seekers of the way of God with me. And uh, that accompanying each other, to me, is one of the, the most powerful gifts. Another piece which I'm very appreciative of in my uh, uh, life uh, serving God has been sort of the adoption by the Dene people that I call it my Dene seminary when they first took me out on a caribou hunt and uh, just to experience like thousands of years the Dene people have used the hunting of caribou to sustain them to clothe themselves to uh, to strengthen them uh, through the summer fall winter and spring all the seasons and so that's been a really helpful uh, thing for me. So I just am really humbled that I've been adopted by uh, my Dene brothers and sisters to be part of their family. What an incredible story, Your Grace. You talked about being able to learn the language, and maybe you can share a little bit more about the different languages, the different cultures and traditions that really surround the population and, and how you've really grown to connect so, so gently and so warmly with these different groups of people? Well, language is not easy to learn. You kind of start at kindergarten or before, and, and so it's humbling. But I find that because God sort of put it on my heart to try to learn the language, then I went in very uh, uh, respectful of the elders and their wisdom. I didn't come in saying, I've got the answers for you. I was saying, how do you say it's hot outside? Or how do you say <laughs> mosquito? And uh, so they became my teachers. Your Grace, when we look at the domestic church and the role of our parents forming the faith, spreading the faith, sharing the faith to their children, what's been your approach as a, as a bishop and to our priests to really help form the faith in our young people and also in our young adults? We've been trying to uh, do work on two key areas. One is youth ministry and one is healing. And so uh, we've had uh, young Catholic uh, students uh, volunteer for a year uh, and, and just be an example of young people on fire for the Lord, of uh, how to pray, how to reach to God and to serve him, and uh, to enter in a dialogue with our young people too and, and those who are seeking as well. So that's been a positive area. Also the healing that grieving and grief has been a, is a huge part of our struggle in the North and, and kind of the self-medicating that goes on when we're going through grief. 
And so uh, healing programs we've tried to uh, have where people are opening about some of the pain and the struggles and reaching to God with it together. And so the power of a healing circle, the power of the saints and our Eucharist uh, healing masses, just to continue to reach for healing strength from God, uh, our, our source of real healing. Your Grace, as you mentioned earlier, your early catching on of the rosary and this prayer and devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary, how have you seen really the role of the Blessed Mother in the lives of the people, particularly in your territories? How is she seen and and revered uh, as the Mother of God and really to help us in our way to Christ? I just was amazed at how much devotion Mother Mary receives. Uh, I I joke that sometimes the Trinity in the North, I think, is Father, Son, and Mother Mary, uh, that she's really well uh, revered. And so there's things like uh, when we have traditional travel routes, usually halfway, there'll be a little shrine. There'll be a statue of Mary, and people will come and they'll make a little offering. Sometimes it'll be a little bit of money. Sometimes it'll be a rosary. Sometimes it'll be a bit of their clothing. Uh, or a little bit of tea or coffee or something, tobacco. Just that sense of gratitude and that you're asking for her to be with you in all your travels and different parts of your life. So uh, they've made me closer to Mother Mary by some of the devotion of uh, our Indigenous people. Right, right. As you reflect on your time thus far as a bishop and really serving as a shepherd to the people, What is the forefront of your mission, the real heart of your ministry as you seek to to know God's will and to be able to serve as a bishop? What's that primary role for you? Often I see it as being a bridge. You know, we have the different cultures and there's so much tension often to divide. And I think we're called to be bridges and that's not an easy job in that we're not completely in our own culture anymore, and yet we're not completely in the other. So there's a certain loneliness that can be part of being a good bridge, and yet we need those bridges. And so my own role and the role of the priests that are with me, the role of our lay leaders who are indigenous themselves, we're all trying to act as those bridges, bringing some unity, reconciliation, peace um, to to our whole culture. Your Grace, I've heard a little bit about the good work being done with the Mental Health First Aid First Nations Certification Training Program. Can you explain a little bit about this program, how you and others have worked in the particular populations that are very much at risk that you're trying to serve and really reach out and to walk with? Often uh, people will come to us, uh, especially the young people struggling with addictions and, and having suicidal thoughts. And uh, so as many of our priests are trying to understand how can I best respond. And so this is one way to sort of get a sense of how to do the initial response to somebody coming forward uh, with that much pain. And uh, so it's just one of many ways we try to uh, provide some support and help people get connected with bigger resources and just uh, also focus on the spiritual component of any healing and health as well. So that program helps us to maybe hopefully have a bit better response to some of those people in crisis. Absolutely, absolutely. What do you see as maybe one of your greatest joys? I know here in our Archdiocese, we just witnessed the ordination of two Catholic priests and it was such a beautiful thing to, to witness a bishop touching those hands right over the head of a newly ordained priest. What really brings you joy in your role as a shepherd? I think it's uh, often the, uh, the gathering on the land of our people. And uh, when the people gather on the land for uh, the prayer and uh, the celebrations, uh, sometimes we'll have the sacrament of confirmation or marry me a marriage. Um, those are just really powerful uh, celebrations. Even uh, a a drum dance, a round dance. Sometimes when we finished an important gathering or or some event that we'll have this round dance together and the drums rolling and us all joined in hands, uh, those are important moments. 
and I pray for some good round dances to continue and that I'm able to be part of them. Yeah. Your Grace, give us a sense of your archdiocese, just the number of people, how many priests are, are out there and other communities, missions that are really serving the people in terms of the needs that are out there and, and just how you're able to reach out and to support our Catholic faithful. So we have about 50 communities as uh, part of our archdiocese, and 14 of them have no road in normally. There's only a winter road for a couple months uh, of the year. And so travel is very challenging by plane or boat or skidoo sometimes, uh, and that uh, that's quite expensive as well. So the travel isn't easy. So some of our places, they only have mass uh, every few months. Uh, that they're able to receive it. Other places, the priest is residing with them. And so there's daily mass. So we try to reach out. Uh, we have about 18 priests, um, uh, ideally, and uh, reaching out to all these different places. But the local lay leaders are very important because they keep the ongoing life of the community happening. So uh, that those are basically, hopefully, the complementarity of uh, these visiting priests and, and uh, trying to be present uh, with, from their other uh, culture and the uh, local people, local lay leaders, too. Your Grace, what do you see for our uh, marriages, for husbands and wives? What are the greatest needs that we have in the home, in the domestic church to continue to bring? You mentioned so much healing, hopefulness, faith, the message of God. But what do our, our families really need today? I think prayer and Mother Mary continue to be key things. You know, the family that prays together stays together. And and trying to encourage our families to have some of those holy habits again. Simple things like just the grace before meals, the grace traveling, uh, the prayer in the morning, the evening, uh, to be at church together, to be doing some of the traditional spirituality. Absolutely. I love that the family that prays together stays together. Such the great rosary priest, Father Peyton, who reminded us of that. So many young people have this question, Your Grace, the purpose and meaning of life. Uh, is life worth living? What is your message to young men and women as they contemplate their purpose, their meaning, and God's presence in their life? I think that each of us have a plan by God for us that is better than we could ever do ourselves. It's not easy to trust, and it's not always easy to hear, uh, but that we find that way to listen, to try to hear that still small voice that God speaks in each of our hearts, to trust it, and then dare to try to live it out. Uh, it's going to be a journey. We'll have our ups and downs, but that will be a rich life. Not easy, but a, a very strong life. And so I just encourage uh, uh, to keep that simple formula, listen to God and do his will as best we can each day. Your Grace, what would be your encouragement about how to pray? You mentioned early on as a young boy, the rosary became your prayer for people who are out in the outskirts, uh, what is your encouragement to learn the basics of prayer? Yeah, I think the rosary remains an important prayer in many of our areas. And uh, we uh, try to encourage that there's a, a devotion through that rosary. The repetitiveness, the uh, meditativeness of it uh, really, I think, allows people to engage it also in their own languages. The rosary is prayed in Cree and Dene uh, in our area. Uh, also, the, uh, the traditional types of spirituality as well, I believe uh, there is a way of them uh, complementing each other and that they, I encourage that as well. And the scriptures, there is a deep need to know the scriptures better, to have that sense of how God has spoken to us there and continues to speak to us. Uh, so to understand God's word and, and how, what it's speaking to us very real today. Uh, I think is something that we're called to help people to recognize as well. And the gift of the Eucharist, the sacraments, that they are not just pious exercises, but they're life rafts in a stormy sea often for us. And the darker the challenges and, and that, the more important they become. And so just to, to use all of those gifts um, to help us in uh, navigating these waters. Right. 
Your Grace, as we come to a close, what is your message, your final message that you could like to leave with our viewers? I like um, the sense of Jesus' calming of the waters and uh, the sense of him being able to say, quiet now, be still. And that in this chaos and tension of the world today, to let Jesus speak those words in our storms as well, quiet now, be still, and to trust that he's bringing something new and to have deep trust in that. He does have that promise. He makes all things new. And I believe that is the truth. Your Grace, it's a pleasure to have you joining us here today on Shalom World's Heart Talk. We will continue to pray for you and for the people in your archdiocese. And we invite our viewers to continue to pray along with you. Would you please help us close with your blessing over our viewers? Seyadari, Marci, Hariyodena, John Nate, Nutsenemi. Nudzia de Gaiha Borskur, Nunia de Gaiha Borskur, and Yadarie, Harriot de Nuts Enemy, et Tobi is a true, Yadarin is on true, Bezit A, Hotia Continenda. May God's blessing and the help of our Mother Mary be with every one of you. Amen. And once again, we thank you for joining us on Shalom World's Heart Talk. And may we continue to join our viewers in praying for our priests and bishops like Archbishop Murray, and continue to pray for an increase to vocations in the priesthood and religious life. Thank you for joining us on Heart Talk, and may God's peace always be with you. to offer my prayerful support and blessings for Shalom World Media and for all of those that support it, for all of those as this, that work in this beautiful ministry of bringing Christ in, into our lives. So may the blessings of the All Holy Trinity be upon you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen.